How cool is it to come to a conference where we start by talking about Leviticus? I feel like I have found my people. Wow. I especially liked the part about canceling debts. Is there anybody who would really like your debts to be wiped out? Could we, Heather, could we just arrange that for next Jubilee conference? Could we just like roll that into the plans that we could just wipe out college debt? All right, I'm glad, I, I'm sure they're working on it. All right, well, how many college students do we have in the house? All right, how many of you are graduating this semester? Okay, how many of you are graduating next year? All right, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to think, wherever you're at in college, whether you're freshman, sophomore, or junior, senior, super senior, I want you to think about how much time you estimate it will take for you to finish, okay? And now I want you to think about what you need to accomplish during that time. Okay, but please stay with me. I don't want anyone hyperventilating. Just make a mental list of the classes you need to take, the internships you need to complete, the projects and papers and job applications. Okay, you with me? Here's what I want you to know. Accomplishing that list does not make you matter, okay? Nothing you do in the next four years can increase your worth as a human being. And nothing you fail to finish in the next four years can diminish your worth, even by a little bit. People often talk about the ground being level at the foot of the cross. And tonight I want to claim the ground is level, the ground is level in the Garden of Eden as well. Every person possesses intrinsic dignity and worth by virtue of being human. No amount of education or worldly success can change that. No platform, you know, you don't reach a certain number of followers on Twitter or Instagram or wherever um, that, that sort of now you have arrived. And no amount of failure can diminish it. So why go to school at all if it doesn't make any difference? Let's be clear, education matters, but it doesn't make you matter. It matters to your skill level as you carry out your vocation, but it doesn't add a cent to your value in God's eyes. We don't present ourselves to God with our, all the letters behind our name, BA or BS, M MFT, MA, PhD, MD. No, when we show up at the pearly gates, we come just as we are, no titles, no degrees. I'm just Carmen. But you and I don't live like this is true. We live like education makes us somebody. And we want to be somebody, so we go into a lot of debt and we work really hard to try to get there. We're trying to prove our existence or ju justify our existence. It's time we let go of that lie. It's time we recognized what the Bible says is true about us. And here it is. From the very moment that the egg of your mother and the sperm of your father met, you mattered. Whether your parents planned for you or not, whether you're in relationship with them or not, at the moment of conception, you already had the most important title you will ever have, Imago Dei, the image of God. You did nothing to earn it, and there's not a thing you can do to disqualify you, because it wasn't your idea to begin with. Whether you're a Christian or not, you are God's idea, God's best idea. And as a human, you're automatically and intrinsically part of God's family. We're talking this weekend about how God is making all things new. We can all see things that are broken around us. And we know that Christ came to redeem the mess that we're in. But know this. God is in the process of restoring all things, not because they've been a dumpster fire to begin with, 
but because in the beginning, God made all things good. Genesis gives us the gold standard of God's design. It expresses what God intended for this world and for humans. Check this out. In Genesis 5, this is, I realize, kind of a weird place to start, but in Genesis 5, we're told when Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. Do we have any Seths in the house? All right, we got a few. Woo, nice, okay. But did you catch that Seth is Adam's image? Is the point that they looked alike? <laughs> I don't think so, because the narrator has just told us that when God created humankind, he made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them. So what we have here is an analogy. Seth is the image of Adam, just like we're the image of God. The guy on the street corner who's down on his luck, the president of your university, the woman who bags your groceries, and the one who examined your MRI or wrote the book that you're reading or the one who painted your dorm room. Every single person is the image of God, God's kin, his family. There are so many things we would like Genesis to tell us that it doesn't say. So many things we're wondering. But Genesis is clear about the things we desperately need to know. This world is not an accident. It's not random. It was not born in chaos or conflict. And the God who made all things established order so that we could flourish. Think of the opening scene of the creation story. The whole world is covered with water. And, it, and we're told the spirit is hovering over the waters. It's this moment pregnant with possibility. God is up to something. Something's about to happen. As the spirit moves out over the world God made, the scene is brimming with hope. In comparison, comparison with other ancient Near Eastern stories, here comes the context Heather warned you was coming. It's striking that God doesn't make humans so that we'll do hard labor so that God can sleep. We're also not made like from the blood of a rebel God, unlike some ancient Near Eastern myths. In the Bible, humans are the crown of creation. We matter. And being God's image comes with a built-in vocation to rule the world. Genesis 1.26 announces, then God said, let us make humankind as our image, as our likeness, so that they may rule. And the next verse specifies who's included in this. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Both male and female. That is to say, all humans are the image of God. And so I'm excited to share with you one of the things that has jumped off the page at me as I've been studying this book, as I've been looking closely at Genesis over the past year. And to do that, we have to go back to verse 26. Because it says, then God said, let us make humankind as our image, as our likeness, so that they may rule over what? Over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, over all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Did you notice what's missing? No human is told to rule over other humans. The vision of Genesis 1 and 2 is partnership. Men and women are to maintain God's ordered world together. It's worth lingering on this question, this issue for a moment longer because many Christians assume that God created a hierarchy between humans, whether by gender or by race or by some other metric at creation. And that assumption, especially the, the hierarchy between genders, that assumption is often based on the fact that according to chapter 2, God made Adam first and then he made Eve as his helper. So let's get a running start and then take another look at that passage in that word to see what it actually means. Genesis 2.15, 
God gave Adam a job to do. He was to cultivate and care for the garden. Yahweh God took the human and put him in the garden to work it and to guard it or keep it. And then God gave Adam parameters in verses 16 and 17. Eat anything you like except from this one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. This particular tree symbolizes human desire to define good and evil for ourselves, to be the arbiter of meaning and morality on our own terms. Instead of this, God wants humans to look to God to define good and evil. He, he wants to be the one to tell us what is good and what is not. And it's in this moment that God declares for the first time that something is not good. It's not good that the man is alone. Verse 18 tells us that he needs a helper suitable to him. So what does the man need help doing? caring for creation within God's parameters, he'll be confronted with the constant temptation to reach out and grab what God said was off limits, to be his own boss. So having a companion will help him stay true to his calling and true to his maker. In the next scene, God brings all the animals past Adam so he can name them, but none of them qualifies to offer the kind of companionship that he lacks. So God makes woman, a fellow human made from the same flesh and bone, the man's side actually, to show their essential similarity. Now let's take another look at the word helper in Hebrew. The Hebrew word is azer. Everybody say it with me. Azer. What is an azer? Well, lucky us, the word occurs a hundred times in the Hebrew Bible. So we can look them all up and see kind of what is the range of meaning for the word. It, the, the hundred times includes its use as a noun and as a verb. So here's what I found surprising as I looked up every single reference and checked the context and tried to process like what is an azer? It's used consistently in one of two ways. Number one, to describe God as Israel's helper. And number two, to refer to a military ally. So if another army is attacking you and you're not strong enough, you need an azer, a military ally, some units of soldiers who can come and bolster your, your fight. Not one time in the entire Hebrew Bible is the word azer used to describe what a servant does for a master. So from the very beginning, from the very beginning, the relationship of men and women is portrayed as a strong partnership. Both are the image of God, and both are called to the task of carrying out God's work side by side. And we have seen some beautiful examples of that on this stage already tonight. After each day in Genesis 1, God called creation good. But after he made men and women, he called it very good. Now let's fast forward to Genesis 9. After Adam and Eve's failure to keep the one rule God gave them, they were supposed to help each other do God's work within God's parameters, but instead they kind of went along with each other in disrupting creation. Adam and Eve are expelled from the garden, alienated from God's presence. I wasn't assigned to talk about the fall. That's tomorrow morning. In fact, but just we're fast forwarding to, to chapter 9. In fact, humans collectively had become so violent that, and oppressive that God hit the reset button by sending a flood. The result was so disappointing. But after the flood, as dry land emerged and humans stepped out of the ark, one thing had not changed. Humans were still the image of God. God tells Noah, whoever sheds human blood, by humans shall their blood be shed. For as the image of God has God made humankind. Did you catch that? God explains that the Imago Dei is still the basis for ethical treatment of other people. We must treat every person with dignity because humans are still God's image. Human rebellion, whether inside or outside of the garden, did nothing to change our identity 
and our vocation or our essential worth. Humans also still have a job to do, presiding over God's creation. But remember, as we already established, nothing we do over the course of our lifetime can increase our worth as a human being. We don't do this work so that we matter. We already matter. And so we're free to contribute. This is an important distinction for many reasons. But chiefly because none of us is always capable of contributing. We all start out as babies, right? Do we have anybody who skipped that stage? Okay. We all start out as babies. We don't know how to walk. We don't know how to talk. We can't see very far. We need somebody to feed us. Most of us will spend our later years of life with impairments in mobility and sight and maybe even speech or reason. Some of us live our entire lives with physical or other limitations. If we tie the Imago Dei to something that we can do or some capacity that we possess, then humans fall along a sliding scale. Some are more qualified to be God's image than others. I think, therefore I am, is not a biblical description of human personhood. Sorry, Descartes. That doesn't work theologically, and it's not consistent with biblical teaching. Every human being is the image of God. There's nothing we can do to matter more or to matter less. And as we're able, we are invited to live into our God-given identity by harnessing whatever capacities we do have for kingdom work. But there are no prerequisites. Just by being human, just by physically taking up space, we point to the reality that our creator reigns over all. You can fulfill your, vac your vocation as the image of God while lying in bed in chronic pain. You can fulfill your image, your vocation as God's image, while you're climbing Mount Everest. The only qualification is embodiment. So let's just check how many of you tonight have a body. Everybody bring their body with them tonight? Okay, sweet. That's what I thought. To be human, we need a body. That's it. That's the only prerequisite. That's what an image is. It's a physical representative of the deity. All right, so let's go history nerd for a moment. Every ancient Near Eastern temple, except for Israel's, had an image to represent whatever God was being worshipped there. Israel's temple did not have an image of stone or silver or any other material because Yahweh, the God of Israel, made humans to be his image. God wanted us here, there, and everywhere to represent his rule over creation. Here's a statue of the ancient Near Eastern king of Guzan, Hadad Yil. I guess that's how to say it. He conquered a vast territory to add it to his kingdom, but he couldn't be everywhere at once, so he set up this statue. This image represented him, reminding everyone who was in charge. Similarly, God reigns over all the earth, and to remind creation of his rule, he appointed us. He appointed humans as his physical representatives. We're not in charge. God is. Humans are God's ambassadors. We rule on God's behalf. We take our orders from God. Human identity and vocation have not changed. It is our privilege as humans to carry on the good work that God began in the garden, naming and creating and cultivating and making spaces in which other humans and animals and plants can, plants can flourish. No one in this room is capable of doing this work alone. We need each other. And that's why God made a companion for Adam. That's why God said to his male and female images, fill should I try that again? Fill the earth and subdue it. Make babies and raise children and spread out to every corner of the world so that every place has a physical reminder of God's rule. 
Not everyone recognizes this task, of course. Most humans, many humans, do not acknowledge the existence of God, much less their identity as God's image. They imagine that their identity is self-constructed or self-determined. But remember, the image of God is not something we choose. God chose it for us. It happened at the moment of conception, the moment we became part of God's family. And here an analogy might help. If you become estranged from your parents, say your relationship just breaks down to the point where it, you can no longer be in contact with them, and you cut off communication. There is nothing you can do to change the fact that you're their child. Like, having been born, having them as your parents can't be erased, even if you fall out of relationship. And it's like that with the Imago Dei. Every human being is the image of God, whether they recognize it or not. It's a birthright, an identity that can't be erased. We can never fully know ourselves outside of knowing the God who created us. And we can never fully know God without recognizing the claim he has on our lives. So if we want to experience all the glory that God has in mind for us as his children, then we must lean into our God-given identity as the Imago Dei. So carry on in your studies. Learn math and science. Paint pictures and write stories. Learn to listen well and communicate clearly. Decipher puzzles and explore history and design programs and equipment to make this world an even better place. But don't do this to find a sense of self-worth. You are already the image of God. Nothing you do will elevate your status in God's eyes. A few years ago, I was in an Amtrak station. I had just purchased my ticket, and I was looking for a place to sit. My eyes scanned the room, and I caught the eye of a man who was standing across the way, and we smiled at each other, and I went to sit down. And he came over and sat down beside me and struck up a conversation. And since I was just waiting for 45 minutes, we talked and talked and talked. I should tell you that I was going home from an academic conference. I had spent almost a week with college professors and PhD students, publishers, and school presidents. I had rubbed shoulders with provosts and department chairs and heard research presentations and bought scholarly monographs. All the marks of greatness in the world I inhabit as an academic. And now we were in this train station. I had come down from the ivory tower. I regret that I did not ask my new friend his name. I'll call him Anthony. But I can tell you this about him. Anthony was grounded. He exuded life. He had a sparkle in his eyes. And as we talked, he, he was completely selfless, completely engaged. He poured life into me. Maybe for the first time in a whole week, I felt seen. I felt loved. He listened well. We talked about scripture, and we talked about prayer, and we talked about trauma, and we talked about all the things you talk about when... You're in an Amtrak station for 45 minutes. Anthony was a US Army veteran. He had served overseas and was working on a master's degree. He was hoping to find a cure for cancer. Anthony was pushing a huge black suitcase on wheels. Everything he owned was in that suitcase because Anthony lived on the streets. And as the train pulled away from the station, I had a lot to think about. Because Anthony showed me more humanity in that 45-minute conversation than any of the so-called important people that I met at the academic conference, all of whom were followers of Jesus, to be clear. Education does not make us more human. Neither does wealth or status or titles. What we need most is to recognize the worth we already have and to let it sink in, to sink ourselves 
in to that. God created this world good, and he gave us a role to play in it. We belong, and we matter. Look around you. The humans occupying this space are the image of God, too. Each of you brings different skills and passions to the task. Together, we can carry on the good work that God began. We're invited to participate, and it's our joy to do that together. I want to tell you, thank you, I want to tell you, um, I want to pray for you. First, I just want to say, um, Byron has already told you about the book that's coming out on being God's image. In that book, I talk about what I've just said here, but then I work out its implications for lots of different areas, not just gender partnership, but race relations, disability, um, suffering, uh, epistemology, uh, sex and pornography. I, I think about what are all the areas of life that should be impacted by this doctrine. If it's true, then where does this take us? What needs to change? And so I invite you, if you're interested, to pick up a postcard. There's postcards um, with a QR code on the back for a discount um, over in the Hearts and Minds bookstore. Um, and I, I hope it encourages you as you try to live this out in practice in your world. But now let me pray for you. Father, what a privilege to stand in a room full of hundreds of people made as your image. All the people who've come from far distances, all the people who've worked behind the scenes to make this happen, thank you, Lord, for the blessing and the privilege that it is to work side by side with, what, with such amazing humans. Thank you that you look at us and, you, and when you see us, you don't see our flaws. You see how you created us very good. And you see the dignity and worth that you instilled in us. Thank you that when you look at us, you see potential. You see all of the ways that you've wired us uniquely to contribute to this world. Father, would you help us to become less self-conscious, less worried about what other people think of us, less worried about what we think of them? Could you help us to lean into this truth about who we are? And could you help us see this area that we're studying in college, how it connects with your grand vision for all of creation, for the ways that you want people and animals and plants to flourish, and for the unique ways that you've wired each one of us to contribute to that flourishing. Father, help us to see where your spirit is stirring and to say yes to say yes with our energy, to say yes even with our weakness, to say yes with everything we are and everything we're not. Lord, give us courage to step into places where you're asking us to show up, knowing that it's not about how qualified we are, but it's how qualified you are. Thank you for your promise to be with us. Lord, there may even be people in this room tonight who aren't sure where they stand with you. They're not maybe even convinced that you are or, or that they matter to you. Father, would you get past the defenses and the doubts and would you just show up in a tangible way? Would, you, would your spirit kindle in the hearts of everyone here a deep awareness of how much you love us? Would we hear you whispering our name and inviting us into whatever you have next? Lord, thank you for the privilege of representing you in this world 
to each other and with each other. Teach us to partner together to carry out the work you started. In Jesus' name, amen.